Santiago Luis Polanco Rodriguez was born on June 16, 1961, in the city of Santiago in the Dominican Republic. He emigrated to the United States with his family in 1969 and settled in the Washington Heights neighborhood of New York City, a racially diverse section home to Jews, Greeks, African Americans, and Cubans, but becoming an increasingly popular destination for Dominican immigrants. He and his family settled in the heart of Washington Heights, a neighborhood commonly referred to as just the Heights. He lived on West 174th Street in this very building. Polanco Rodriguez learned the ways of the streets very early on and was part of a youth gang which included a local Dominican street hood named Franklin Cuevas. The gang took part in numerous criminal activities such as car theft and chain snatching. Santiago attended JFK High School in the Marble Hill section of the Bronx, and although he was a smart kid, traditional schooling wasn't where his focus was. He found some direction in the sport of boxing and trained as an amateur in a small basement gym at 539 West 163rd Street, which was named the West Side Athletic Club. The gym was owned and ran by a Puerto Rican trainer named Artemio Colon, who was known as Papa, and was schooled by Mike Tyson's legendary trainer, Customato. In 1979, while Santiago was a junior at JFK High School, he entered the Golden Gloves Boxing Tournament in the sub-novice 126-pound weight division and fought a tough fight in the second bout of the preliminaries, but he lost a close decision and didn't advance. Not long afterwards, he dropped out of high school and took to the blocks of Washington Heights to sell cocaine. He became known in the streets as Yayo, a nickname of undetermined origins, but may possibly be a variation of Yago, which is a common nickname for those with the first name Santiago. Yayo partnered up with a boxing teammate of his from the Westside Athletic Club, 20-year-old Roberto Mejia, who also came from the Dominican Republic and grew up on West 178th Street. Mejia himself was a high school dropout and youth gang member who had been arrested several times for various offenses, which included car theft. Mejia was a very talented amateur boxer. In the 1981 Golden Gloves tournament, he defeated James Buddy McGirt in the quarterfinals. McGirt would later go on to become a professional boxing world champion in two weight classes. After defeating McGirt, Mejia made it all the way to the 139-pound finals bout at Madison Square Garden and won the fight to become the Golden Gloves champion. He finished his amateur career with a stellar record of 25-2, then turned professional. Mejia was known in the streets as Capo, and he and Yayo developed a close partnership while selling cocaine right outside of his building on this very block and at the nearby intersection of West 174th and Autobahn. By the early 80s, Washington Heights had experienced a significant inpouring of Dominicans, many of whom came from the cities of Santiago and San Francisco de Macorís, both of which are major hotbeds for narcotics activity and transport hubs for Colombian cartels. Numerous immigrants from those cities were involved with the cartels, who were now relying on Dominicans in New York to handle street distribution, leading to a major influx of cocaine activity in the area. By 1982, at the age of 21, Yayo had developed a small cocaine crew, which included his half-brother, who was also named Santiago and known as Cheeky, as well as Capo and the local kids that they hired to sell for them. Yayo had a keen business sense and applied marketing strategies in selling his product. He sold high-quality cocaine, which he named Coke Is It, a play on the popular slogan used by Coca-Cola at the time. He and his clique worked along Audubon Avenue, which is close to the George Washington Bridge that connects uptown Manhattan to New Jersey, and thus a prime selling location due to the suburban commuters and other travelers going to and from Jersey. 
they could take a short detour off the West 178th Street exit and pull up to Sellers on Audubon Avenue, make a purchase, and then be on their way. Seeing that suburbanites had become a profitable demographic for him, Yayo appealed to them by carefully selecting dealers who appeared non-threatening and instructed them to never rob, hassle, or intimidate customers. In 1982, police found him in possession of a 9mm handgun and burglary tools, and he was sentenced to a short jail stint at Rikers Island. During this time, Capo stepped in to head things, and despite him compiling a 7-1 professional boxing record during the prior year, including a fight on an ESPN card in Atlantic City, he couldn't avoid the allure of the streets and its fast money. Yayo was released after serving nine months at Rikers and went right back to his activities on Audubon Avenue. He varied his marketing techniques to further improve his brand's notoriety, which resulted in solid earnings, enough that he was able to buy a brand new 1984 Mercedes-Benz for $43,000, which he paid for in all cash. Cocaine sales were steady, but soon another drug would drastically change the dynamics of his operation. In Los Angeles, California, a potent new substance had emerged. A smokable derivative of cocaine known as rock was gaining popularity in the streets. It's created through a cooking process involving baking soda, which frees the powdered base from additives, forming a purer substance. The name of the extracted product also doubled as the term to describe its usage. In 1982, law enforcement in LA had encountered rock on limited occasions, but by 1983 it was appearing with more frequency, and by the end of 1984 it had escalated into a problematic trend around the city. By then it was coming to be known as crack, a term which allegedly originated from the crackling sound that it made while being heated. The first coverage of the drug by a major newspaper was in the LA Times on November 25th, 1984. It was also in late 1984 when it came to the attention of police in the South Bronx after they encountered some individuals using it. In early 1985, Yayo was introduced to the substance, although it's unclear exactly how. One account says it was two black drug dealers from Harlem that taught him how to cook it. Another account says it was members of the Colombian cartel that he was connected with. Whatever the case, he saw the product's potential and decided to start selling it. He set up operations in several apartments, one where workers cooked it and packed the rocks into small glass vials with red tops, and others were used for storage and sales. They marketed their product under the name Basteballs, which combined the term free base with the fact that the rocks were small, white, and round like baseballs. They introduced the product to their regular customers and sold red top vials at $5 or $10 a piece, and the larger vials known as Jumbos went for $20. He and his dealers distributed business cards bearing the slogan Cop and Go and included gimmicks such as price discounts on the weekends, two-for-ones, and Ladies' Day. With the potency of the new substance, as well as the clever advertising, sales took off, and the gang added additional employees and opened up more locations. Yayo modeled his group after the pyramid structure of Colombian cartels. Below the brand owners were the mid-level managers who oversaw the street managers. The street managers in turn supervised the location managers and the location managers managed the dealers and other street level workers. Employees were only supposed to know the individuals one level above them, but nobody higher up than that. One department included the people who prepared and packaged the product, another consisted of those who secured and transported deliveries, and then one was comprised of the street sellers. Within a short time, Baseballs was a sophisticated and prosperous operation which pulled in hundreds of thousands of dollars a week and was the first known ring in New York to move the product in quantity. Several of Yayo's family members worked with him, 
Along with Cheeky, his other brother Elvis delivered stashes to the street locations, and a third brother named Santiaguito was a cash courier. His sister Dulce and mother Luisa counted the money and maintained the production and stash apartments, while Capo oversaw a squad of enforcers, which included hitmen imported from Santiago. Yayo was a no-nonsense, disciplined, and demanding leader who ran a tight ship, kept tabs on his organization, and instilled fear in his underlings. He had the prototypical characteristics which many successful crime leaders seem to possess. A charming personality, the ability to control and lead others, and perhaps most importantly, the duality of having a vicious side, which kept his workers and associates in line and made them wary of ever daring to cross him. He relied on Capo to facilitate the enforcement work for the organization for both internal and external matters. If any workers were accused of weakening the product or skimming money, Capo would see to it that they were beaten with baseball bats. One day in early 1985, a baseball spot was robbed, and when it was learned that it was some members of a Heights youth gang named the Playboys, that same day, Yayo, Capo, and their enforcers headed to George Washington High School to find them. There, they found the gang commiserating outside of the high school and then chased after them and caught one of the kids who they gave a vicious beatdown to. The new substance was catching on in the streets with Yayo's name becoming synonymous with the powerful product. The drug's euphoric effects quickly ensnared users, which led to plentiful return customers. Local street kids were eager to work for the neighborhood icon, including a teen from West 171st Street and former Playboy's gang member named Lenny Sepulveda. Yayo schooled the ambitious and dedicated Lenny, who quickly became adept at the game. He was taught how to set up and secure production apartments, then was promoted to manage a spot at West 166th Street in Amsterdam. Lenny's brother Nelson joined him, and both also handled enforcement work for Yayo, and on one occasion Lenny was sent to burn down a drug rival's apartment in the Bronx. After a few months, Lenny was allegedly let go due to his sales not meeting Yayo's expectations, and then Lenny took his experience to the South Bronx, where he established his own crew of hustlers, which would one day evolve into the notoriously homicidal Dominican drug gang, which was known as the Wild Cowboys. Franklin Cuevas, the leader of the youth gang that Yayo once belonged to, would also become a part of the Wild Cowboys. Hustlers from other areas of Washington Heights and nearby Harlem had followed suit and established their own retail spots. One of the earliest mentions of the substance in New York came in a daily news article from October 31st, 1985, about 19 people being busted for selling it near Bryant Park in Manhattan. Then, when the New York Times printed an article about it on November 29, 1985, it brought even more attention to the growing problem. When 1986 came around, it would not only be the year that it reached far beyond the streets of New York and L.A., but also when the baseball's operation was launched to a whole new level. Their turf of Washington Heights was the most saturated by the drug and thus highly profitable areas. And additionally, Yayo had scaled up by switching to a major Dominican cocaine supplier who dealt directly with Colombian cartels. The ring was now mass producing, selling thousands of vials a day and was the largest distribution network in the entire city. Yayo made frequent trips to the Dominican Republic to meet with narcotics contacts there, as well as to invest in businesses and properties. And while he was in DR, Capo and Chiki ran things in New York. Around this time, other small drug gangs had formed in the nearby area, such as the one run by the Ramos brothers, Milton, Yenny, George, and Nelson, four brothers of Dominican descent who operated one block away on West 175th Street and coexisted amicably with Yayo. The brothers sold their rocks in green top vials under the brand name Lido, which was named after a Latin American soft drink, which was known to make people thirsty for more. The Ramos brothers formed a partnership with Yayo and soon operated as a subsidiary of baseballs. 
Yayo used his enforcement arm to eliminate or force out nearby competitors, which included the 007 and Conan brands, both of which would come under his ownership. 007 was being sold on this very stretch of block on West 173rd Street, which was busy with foot traffic and a profitable location, and Yayo paid the owner $40,000 to take over his territory. While the price might have seemed low for some lucrative drug real estate, it wasn't as much an offer as it was a buyout backed by armed enforcers. As the spring of 1986 neared, the baseballs, Conan, and Lido brands controlled a major part of Washington Heights. Dealers set up near the exit ramps off the GW Bridge, at boutique shops along Audubon Avenue, at telephone booths on Amsterdam Avenue, in apartments on West 177th Street, at numerous corners on St. Nicholas Avenue, and also in several areas across the bridge in the Bronx near the Grand Concourse. Workers were now handing out discount cards, some of which offered a dollar off of $10 purchases. For the baseball's brand, street sellers got paid a commission on every vial sold and pulled in about $2,000 a week in profit. The managers got paid $800 a week plus a commission on every vial sold, and the brand owners walked away with a minimum profit of $40,000 a week. The Conan brand pulled in between $70,000 and $140,000 a week, with the street sellers getting paid $2 per every vial, which made them a profit of about $2,000 a week, while the mid-level managers were paid $3 a vial and were given a daily stipend of $100 per day to monitor everything and they walked away with about $2,500 a week in profit. And the brand owners themselves also made about $40,000 minimum per week in profit. The Lido ring was the smallest of the three and had a similar payoff structure, with brand owners pulling in about $20,000 a week. Yayo opened up a string of additional spots in the South Bronx and Harlem, including a prime location at the intersection of Edgecombe Avenue and West 145th Street, which was conveniently situated just over the 145th Street Bridge from the Bronx. He was also networking with people from different parts of New York and recruited gang members from as far as Flatbush, Brooklyn. With the organization's rise in prominence, the hit squad had to keep things in line and was allegedly responsible for murders of both rivals and two-timing employees. The extraordinary amount of cash coming in caused Yayo the problem that all top-level drug dealers will have at some point, how to account for all the illegal money. And he accomplished this in several ways. He had accountants on staff to manage the income and owned a wire transfer storefront in Washington Heights that wired hundreds of thousands of dollars a week to a finance company in the Dominican Republic that he also owned. He hired drug mules in the form of elderly women to carry back bundles of cash to the Dominican Republic, as well as to bring kilos of powder into the United States. Yayo would start his morning by drinking a cup of coffee and reading the New York Post newspaper. Then at some point in the day, he would exercise. He was now a powerfully built man who had added significant musculature since his days as a lightweight boxer. His love of boxing continued and he frequently attended boxing matches at Madison Square Garden. When he pulled up to a location in the Heights in one of his luxury cars, he would stop traffic as people attempted to get a glimpse of the neighborhood's drug boss. His bodyguards would exit the vehicle before him to make sure that the streets were cleared for his arrival so he could walk by unbothered. On other days, he could be seen cruising around the Grand Concourse in the Bronx in his gold Mercedes. He had also expanded to Yonkers, New York, where Capo and his wife headed a baseball's chain out of an apartment, which was bringing in over $200,000 a week. Crews could now be found all over the five boroughs and the outskirts of New York, but the Heights was where it all began, and thus had a head start in the turmoil brought on by the substance, and was now an open-air drug market. 
The 34th Precinct of Washington Heights was overwhelmed, and despite adding additional officers, they struggled to contain the huge spike in crime, violence, and murder. But the 34th Precinct also had another issue. There was little that they could do about the drug selling since they had a department policy in place against making high-level narcotics cases. This rule was adopted in the early 1970s to prevent police corruption in their precinct when it was found out that nearly every member of the narcotics unit was corrupt. At that time in the Heights, it was common to see a police car drive right past the busy drug corner and keep going, which in turn gave dealers little worry about making sales out in the open. The desperation of the situation led authorities to come up with another approach, and in April of 1986, uniformed police officers had begun Operation Clean Heights, whose goal was to push buyers out of the area and to also seize their vehicles. Then in May, the DEA joined in and began a campaign formed with 101 undercover officers targeting sellers. Although police corruption in the Heights may have been largely suppressed during the prior years, the new booming drug landscape led dirty cops to rear their heads once again. Yayo had several officers on the take who were bribed with payoffs to not arrest his dealers and to alert him about any investigations or informants. The same month the DEA campaign began, Yayo's hitmen shot a man to death in the elevator of a Bronx building due to them receiving information about him being a snitch. On another occasion, a hitman was sent to kill someone who had ripped off one of Yayo's drug spots, and after the man was shot to death in the Highbridge Park in Washington Heights, Yayo instructed the assassin to drive a nail through his head. It's unclear why Yayo would have him perform this seemingly unnecessary act after the man was dead, but it may have been symbolic to Yayo in some way. The campaign efforts resulted in several hundred arrests of both buyers and sellers, dozens of seized vehicles, and the confiscation of many vials as well as handguns. But more importantly, some of those arrested were turned into informants who were helping them build intel on the baseballs and Lido rings. However, the demand had become so substantial that even if one dealer was taken off of a corner, another one would soon replace him. Dwellings where people congregated to use, sell, or buy rocks were appearing all over urban neighborhoods. As soon as the police shut down one spot, another would soon pop up. But the drug's euphoric rush also came with some major downsides. The acute effects of moderate use included increased heart rate and blood pressure, strong insomnia, and decreased appetite while heavy usage could cause a variety of serious neurological and cardiovascular complications. By the summer of 1986, Yayo had been distancing himself from day-to-day -day operations and was relying on his family and managers to handle things in New York, while he spent more time in the Dominican Republic building on his investment empire there. His holdings in DR had grown to include numerous real estate properties and several businesses which helped him wash money, such as a finance company and a pharmacy. Capo, Chiki, and the Ramos brothers also invested with him there, and the ring opened up two nightclubs at a cost of around $2 million each. By now, crack was plaguing many cities around the country, but reports showed that the Northeast U.S., from Boston down to D.C., was the most affected by it, particularly New York City, Newark, New Jersey, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Then, in June of 1986, the perils of the narcotic were thrust into the national spotlight. 22-year-old Maryland college basketball star Len Bias died after using the substance only two days after he was selected with the second pick in the NBA draft by the Boston Celtics. An elite young athlete succumbing to the drug's side effects instantly caught the nation's attention and set off a media storm which made it an ongoing topic in the news. By July of 1986, the murder rate in Washington Heights had increased by an astounding 63% compared to the same time during the prior year, and all crime except rape was up in New York City. The price of baking soda in the city had gone through the roof, 
with many bodegas and grocery stores barely being able to replenish stock to keep up with the demand. To publicize the massive problem afflicting the area, New York State Senator Alphonse D'Amato and U.S. Attorney Rudolph Giuliani donned disguises and went out and purchased from dealers in Washington Heights. Throughout late 1986, baseballs continued to earn immense revenue, and Yayo had moved his production apartments to the Kingsbridge Heights neighborhood of the Bronx to be more centrally located to his marketplace, and the Ramos brothers utilized apartments and a basement in a building at 600 West 183rd Street. In addition to the local customers, on average, seven to 9,000 cars from New Jersey were crossing over into Washington Heights every week to make purchases, which caused large traffic jams on the city blocks where the cars would be swarmed by aggressive salesmen. Most of the people arrested for possession in the Heights were Jersey residents, and among those included lawyers, students, housewives, and teachers, with some other individuals traveling more than 200 miles just to make a purchase. Police officers began targeting cars with New Jersey plates to the point that many buyers from Jersey began parking their cars several blocks away from the drug spots to avoid detection. Then the organization took a hit in December when Capo's drug house in Yonkers was raided by police. There they seized $713,000 in cash, 40 pounds of cocaine, five pounds of rocks, a money counter, and business records. Capo and his wife were arrested and charged with possession and conspiracy to sell narcotics. Although an integral part of the organization was ostensibly out of the picture, others stepped in to fill Capo's role and business affairs continued as usual. A few weeks later, Yayo threw a Christmas party for his employees at a social club in Washington Heights. Dozens of dealers attended the gathering and were served classic Dominican food and beverages such as Mangu and DR's trademark beer, Presidente. By now, the gang was comprised of over a hundred people and members were pushing product on dozens of street corners throughout Washington Heights, Harlem, and various parts of the Bronx. They hardly sold powdered cocaine anymore as the profitability of the glass vials filled with white rocks had far surpassed it. Law enforcement estimates on how much revenue the baseball's enterprise pulled in during a year's time range from $20 million to as high as $36 million, making Yayo one of the richest drug dealers in the country. Whatever the exact number, at just 25 years old, Yayo had created a massive drug empire and was likely both the first mass marketer of crack and the first Dominican kingpin in the entire United States.